For nearly two centuries, societies have weighed the merits of free market capitalism and socialism. Debates continue over which system maximizes prosperity and better promotes human flourishing. Free market capitalism decentralizes economic decisions, giving individuals control over what to produce, how much to charge, and what to buy. Their decisions are informed by market prices, which convey important information about scarcity and consumer value. Proponents contend that capitalism delivers the best economic outcomes by giving individuals incentives to create and produce. Critics, on the other hand, point to the persistence of poverty in market economies and rising inequality as proof that capitalism fails to deliver broad-based prosperity. They maintain that this inequality ultimately gives the rich disproportionate economic and political power. In contrast, socialism grants the government the authority to make most economic decisions. The government chooses how to allocate scarce resources based upon what it determines to be most useful to society as a whole. Proponents argue that socialism ensures society's resources are fairly distributed. Critics claim that socialism fails to give people proper economic incentives to innovate and produce, which ultimately reduces economic opportunities for all. Opponents further argue that socialism's powerful central governments become autocratic and threaten political freedom. So which system is better for humanity? For as long as this question has been asked, the debate all too often devolves into name-calling and emotional arguments that fail to advance the discussion. And yet, it is imperative that we keep asking. The Human Prosperity Project at the Hoover Institution seeks to overcome these preconceptions. It employs analysis of free market capitalism and socialism and its many variants to assess how each system affects human flourishing. Welcome to the Human Prosperity Project here at the Hoover Institution. I'm Russ Roberts, the John and Jean Denault Research Fellow at Hoover and host of the weekly podcast, Econ Talk. This speaker series is based on research and commentary from Hoover scholars participating in the Human Prosperity Project on socialism and free market capitalism. The overarching goal of this project is to investigate the historical record, to assess the consequences for human welfare, individual liberty, and interactions between nations of various economic systems. Go to hoover.org slash human prosperity project to find essays and videos from this series, including prior events. During today's presentation, feel free to use the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen to submit questions to today's panelists. I'm joined today by two Hoover colleagues, Russell Berman and Michael Oslin, to discuss the history of socialism and free market capitalism in two uh, historical contexts. Both have written essays for this project that are available online at hoover.org. Russell Berman is a senior fellow here at the Hoover Institution and the Walter A. Haas Professor in the Humanities at Stanford. He specializes in the study of German literary history and cultural politics. His latest book is Retreat, America's Withdrawal from the Middle East. Michael Oslin is the Pace and J. Treat Distinguished Research Fellow in Contemporary Asia, specializing in U.S. policy and Asian geopolitical issues in the Indo-Pacific region. His latest book is Asia's New Geopolitics, Essays on Reshaping the Indo-Pacific. Our topic for today is what we can learn from recent economic history of Germany and China. Michael, let's start with you. What do we learn from China's growth over the last 20 years, which has been quite spectacular? Is this evidence for the virtues of capitalism or socialism? Uh, the answer is yes, Russ. Uh, it's actually, uh, it, it speaks to the virtues of state capitalism. It also speaks to the limitations of state capitalism. Um, we have to go back a little bit and, and understand the context that was both domestic and global when uh, talking about the growth in China um, the United States began reaching out uh, to Communist China, the People's Republic of China, in the early 1970s. Of course, President Nixon's famous secret trips there and Henry Kissinger, Henry Kissinger's secret trips followed by President Nixon's surprise visit. Um, this was a China that was, it's hard to remember, completely isolated from the world. It was in the depths of Maoist madness, Mao Zedong's cultural revolution, which had followed the spectacularly disastrous Great Leap Forward. 
Uh, and Mao was, was in his last years. Uh, Nixon was there in 1972. Mao was largely incapacitated. In 1976, he died. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, after a few years, took over. And right when the United States normalized relations with China in 1979, Deng launched what became known as, as the Great Reform and Opening Up of China. So you had two parallel processes going on at the same time. And in fact, they couldn't have happened one without the other. In China, there was a leadership that had decided to put the autarky and the isolationism, the self-imposed isolationism of the Mao era behind it. And on the American side was a government that was now willing to bring China into the global system, into the global world. There were fits and starts. Uh, Deng had to relaunch his reforms in the early 1990s. And it wasn't until 2001 that China entered the World Trade Organization. So you can see periods in which the, what people did not know, let's put it this way, people didn't know how far this would go and didn't know how successful it would be. Now it has been about 20 years, as, as you've said, since China came into the World Trade Organization. And that's really the China that we're thinking about, the China that became in a spectacularly fast fashion, historically unprecedentedly fast fashion, the second largest, or depending how you count it, largest economy in the world, the largest trading partner, or the first, second, or third largest trading partner of every nation in the world, the largest exporter, the largest importer, so on and so forth, the China that we know today. But there are two Chinas during this story. One is the China under Deng and his successor, Jiang Zemin, up through roughly 2008, let's say, not to be too put too fine a point on it, but roughly 2008. That is indeed a China in which we saw a great deal of opening up to the world, a great deal of market development within China, of, of attempts to figure out uh, how, well, and I'll get more to this in a second, maintaining Communist Party control, you could nonetheless have a China that was would have um, you know companies that worked in the world that would have foreign businesses, so on and so forth. But starting actually early in, the, in about the mid-1990s, but then picking up pace so that by the mid-2000s, it really began to, uh, to become a significant element, was a turnaround away from this, so that you had a China that now was less of the sort of Wild West capitalism that we saw, and much more of a state capitalist model, one in which the party was dominant over all sectors of society, including the economic sectors, in which the absolute number of state-owned enterprises shrunk but their concentration and role in the economy grew so that they're more important today than they were before. And the imposition most recently under Xi Jinping of an ideology that prioritizes the Leninist state control over the type of, of, of sort of free market uh, economic development that we thought China had adopted back in the 1980s and 1990s. So on the surface, China seems to be doing quite well with this uh its own state capitalist system. Do you trust their numbers? Should we trust their numbers? It, you know, it's particularly relevant in line with the uh, pandemic and the claims that they've somehow uh, had minimal death numbers. I think a lot of people are skeptical of that, but their economic data, and it's not just China, nations all over the world lie about their, or dissemble or exaggerate their economic success or downplay it to get more, say, aid from international organizations. Where do you think we are in terms of the accuracy of what we know about China and how they're doing? That's a crucial question. You also started off by asking, so it looks like that system worked. And that's a, that's a separate question. Uh, but it's an important one as well, which is, you know, how well has the system worked? Massive income disparities uh, in China today between the coastal regions and the interior regions. Massive uh, differences in wealth accumulation between the favored elites uh, the middle classes and certainly the upper middle classes uh, and the bulk of, of what we used to call the peasantry, the, you know, the, the ordinary workers, uh, the, the lower class urban workers, and then of course actually the peasants out uh, in the countryside. Massive environmental devastation throughout the country. Real questions as to just how, um, uh, how innovative China really is, the, 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 the theft of intellectual property from around the world. We'll never know, though it would be a fascinating project to try to figure out just how much of China's 
today's China, today's economic behemoth, is due to stealing intellectual property from around the world that it could not, come, could not have come up with itself. And if it had played by the rules, so to speak, would have meant much lower uh, rates. And then the sort of fundamental economic question about growth versus development, starting from such an extraordinarily low level in the mid 1970s, you could have decades of growth just to get China up to a, a, a low middle income status. In some ways it's gone beyond that, but in other ways it hasn't. And the real question is whether it can continue to, do, uh, to, to move into development, which is long-term and sustainable. Your question then about the, um, uh, uh, can we trust the numbers is, is, a, is a crucial one. Um, the short answer is no. The longer answer is, yeah, but we don't know what we can and can't trust. So we're sort of working in the dark. Um, we can look at certain data points, for example, the fact that the government um, sanctioned its own Central Statistics Bureau repeatedly, and, and most recently as last year, for falsifying statistics. Um, for uh, very well-documented or, or well-researched economic work that states that uh, the official uh, GDP growth figures, which of course itself is an imperfect measure of, of economic growth, but that the GDP growth figures were inflated by 10 or 15% potentially over the bulk of China's uh, growth period. That, um, uh, that we simply don't know if they know what the actual growth figures are out in the provinces, that, that there are, are lies all along the scale. It's not just that Xi Jinping, for example, might be lying to the world. It's that Xi Jinping is being lied to by his local provincial leaders because they have old-fashioned central government targets uh, to meet. So it, it's a little bit like the blind leading the blind in the sense that we don't really know what to ask, but we know we can't, we can't trust it, and you don't know how to get uh, at the truth. What we do know, of course, is, is the numbers that show a, a macroeconomic slowdown over the past half decade, uh, a capital flight out of the country of well over a trillion dollars showing that the elites are trying to offshore their money. There are enormous questions about the viability of this system over the long run. And in terms of your question about what we can trust or not, I think the world through the, the coronavirus pandemic that began in Wuhan, China, uh, through the lies about the Uyghurs incarceration, through all sorts of other things we can get into about cyber, uh, cyber espionage and, and, and militarization of the South China Sea, the world has essentially learned to put an asterisk next to the statements of the central government, that they can say what they want, the world usually accepts it, and then finds itself having to revise what it thought was a fact. There's more that's going on and the whole truth isn't being revealed. I think there's a day of reckoning coming in response to the pandemic that, you know, it's hard to foresee what exactly it will be, but certainly there's much more unease among the China's trading partners, uh, relying on China's supply chain as in the possibility, given the possibility of a future pandemic, and also the lack of transparency, I think, alarms uh, uh, a lot of folks as well along the lines you're talking about. Uh, what is your take on the uh, WTO uh, decision in 2001? Charles, uh, one of our uh, viewers asked, was that a mistake? What, what's your take on that? Well, it, it depends on, on the perspective you're taking. If we're talking about the perspective of we wanted China to become a major trading partner of the world, then no, it, it wasn't a mistake. If we wanted, if we want to look at it from the perspective of was bringing this massive behemoth low labor cost producer with government subsidies and support into an unfair competition with other countries that would have then had the effect of hollowing out domestic industries and in unfair competition, then the answer is yes. It, it was wrong to bring it into the WTO. Further, if you use the political rationale of every president that tried to get them in, essentially two, Bill Clinton and, and um, uh, George Bush, who talked in, in a very American fashion about believing that as the middle class grew in China through accession to the WTO and growth in, in, in trading relationships around the world, that there would be ultimate liberalization and moderation within China, uh, then the answer was, it wasn't a mistake, but we were, mis we were mistaken as to what would ultimately happen. It's not that it was the wrong bet. It's that we should have we should have been doing due diligence to understand just what the effects were. Excellent paper, actually a touchstone paper now 
a few years old from the National Bureau of, of Economic Research called the China Shock is the main source to look at that looks at how markets around the world and domestic uh, production systems and the like simply could not reach the normal economic equilibrium that you get by bringing in new actors into, into a, a, you know, a bounded economic relationship, meaning you're substituting one producer for another producer, you're, substitu you're, you're creating new choice, you're creating new options. Normally, uh, it, not the markets, but, the, but as societies reach an equilibrium, some jobs are lost, others are created, there is a transition period in which that new normal uh, works itself out. But China was too massive and too large, and the China shock was that the equilibrium simply couldn't be reached. And so you had massive job losses throughout Asia, throughout uh, Western Europe, throughout the Americas, particularly the United States, um, as Chinese producers came in to be able to undercut, underbid uh, Western producers, uh, that it happened so quickly in so many different areas, you know, from, from textiles to electronics and the like, that you had this massive shock of, of the loss of domestic production and therefore this great imbalance of, of people not being able to be retrained and not being able to, um, to, uh, you know, to find new jobs or create new types of industry. Well, that, that paper you reference is, uh, it's by David Otter, A-U-T-O-R yes. at MIT. Uh, interested uh, viewers can also listen to my Econ Talk interview with David. And he has co-authors as well in that paper, but I'm very skeptical of some of that work. Uh, you may, you're probably less skeptical than I am, but that's okay. Um, but I just want to register that I don't think it's, I don't think he has the full picture in his estimates. And as a result, I think it overstates the damage done by China to the US economy. It certainly has been hard on certain manufacturing sectors and on people within those sectors. But I think within the total picture of job churn in the United States over a quarter or a year, it's actually relatively small. I think geographically, it might be very concentrated, which has had you know, important political impacts. Also want to mention, and I'll let you uh, respond to this or anything else I said, and then I'm going to turn to Russell, but we'll hear some about, about Germany. But I also want to mention that you know, it's transformed, certainly transformed the standard of living in China as people have migrated from uh, the countryside into the cities in the hundreds of millions over the last 25 years. And, there's some hope, in my mind at least, that that will lead to a different economic system, but down the road and different kind of political influence. What's your take on that? So first on the author paper, um, I, I think that's a fair assessment. I mean, I was talking specifically about manufacturing and about the changes, and, and clearly you had benefits to American consumers. Uh, you had benefits to investors. You, you, you did have a, a shift within American priorities uh, in, in terms of where would you, as the same, by the way, with other countries, with Japan, with South Korea, with Taiwan, all have had to figure out how do you move up the value added chain, which brings benefits because you simply can't outproduce China at, at lower levels. And China, of course, now is trying to itself move up that value added chain, whether it's chip producing or the like. So I think that's fair, but I do think the overall criticism that, um, that no one expected China to play the dominant global economic role it did, even after getting into the WTO. That if that had been better captured, there at least may have been a different type of debate. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it. Uh, for for that, you did ask a question. I wanted to um, answer near the end, um, not about the author paper, but you asked something else. If you can remind me, it was about um, uh, the migration, the higher standard of living, maybe. Right, Chinese right. The migration, citizens. right. So this is this has been an extraordinary phenomenon uh, in China. Um, but you look, you saw it in Japan in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, as people left the countryside, and that's still a problem with a denuded countryside. In some cases in China, what they did was they then transferred productive centers out to the countryside, like Chongqing, which is the largest city in the world, 30 million people is, is deep in the interior. Wuhan itself, a massive uh, produ producing city deep in the interior. So it's, it's that these, these clusters throughout China began to just you know, act as magnets or sinks, sucking everything in from, from around them. Um, but, but people who move, which you have is a lot of day laborers moving. You have a lot of people who are not moving with official sanctions. So they're not able to get the residency papers that allow them 
to get health care in the cities or allow their children to go to the school in the cities. So what you have are, are a lot of people either living on the margins or families being separated because the wage earner goes and lives in the city, but the, the family stays out in the countryside. And then finally, I'll just say, um, your hope that it would create a different economic system. I would certainly like to think that, but the truth is, is that, and especially under Xi Jinping uh, and the party over the past decade, the reassertion of the Leninist elements of this system, uh, that this is a Leninist state and a Leninist party, uh, have become dominant. So that the idea that the, the economic pressure would somehow have created this change, well, now we have 20 to 30 years of data uh, as to whether or not this would happen. And 20 or 30 year, late, years later on, where we are is that the state has reasserted its strength as opposed to having some of its strength wither away. That doesn't preclude black swans. It doesn't preclude uprisings or rebellions. But right now, if you, if you had to take a bet, you would bet that the state is gonna retain control for a very long time. Well, let's turn to Russell Berman and let's talk a little bit about uh, East and West Germany, that historical uh, lesson. The Berlin Wall was built in 1961 and for almost three decades till it fell in 1989. East in which Germany had very little economic interaction or for uh, interactions between their peoples. The, the two countries were, were separate from each other and each went their own way uh, in terms of their economic system. East Germany more centrally organized, West Germany much more decentralized, East Germany more socialist or communist, West Germany more capitalist. Uh, what happened to those two countries' populations and what do we learn from that? Well, thank you for, uh, for the question. Germany is, of course, an important economic player today, but the story of East Germany, West Germany is a historical matter, unlike China, we just heard about. Uh, the division of Germany began in 1949 in the wake of the Second World War. The Eastern zone had been occupied by the Soviet Union. The West was occupied by the United States, Britain, and France. The West became the Federal Republic of Germany. The East became the so-called German Democratic Republic, or East Germany. And in East Germany, a socialist slash communist uh, policy was instituted. Uh, industry was nationalized, uh, and um, uh, and 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 uh, along with that, uh, so significant restrictions on political freedom were undertaken. In contrast, uh, West Germany developed into what they call a social market economy. In the big picture, a capitalist economy, although with a um, more developed social uh, welfare safety net than we are familiar with in the United States, less so than in Scandinavia. Uh, what was the result of this experiment of two countries, uh, same people, same background, same war history, both countries, both the areas had been devastated in the Second World War? Well, West Germany flourished and East Germany didn't. Uh, uh, before 1961, when the border was still relatively open, significant numbers of the East Germans voted with their feet and moved to the West. The, over the long period, 1950 to 1989, the East German population decreased by about uh, 10 or 11 percent, whereas the West German population grew by 20 percent. Uh, of course, there are multiple factors involved there, but clearly people did not want to stay in, in, in East Germany, even after the wall was built, people tried to escape. They risked their lives to escape. They tried to, to tunnel under or climb over or take, take uh, lifeboats in the ocean to get from east to west. And uh, as I said, many lost their lives. Some, some succeeded. Uh, the East Germans never underwent the sort of market liberalization that took place in part in China, as we, as we just heard. It was a rigorous, rigorously controlled economy. The East Germans were um, significantly poorer than their West German counterparts. Uh, for decades, West Germans would try to send care packages to their, to their East German relatives. It is true that East Germany was more prosperous than some of the other Central European countries, than um, uh, Poland or Hungary, et cetera, uh, but this, uh, this just reflects historical circumstances. German industry was much more developed. The 
uh, the, the education, the workforce was greater than in these, these other countries, Poland much more agricultural than Germany, et cetera. At the end of the day, we have a, a clear test case of capitalism versus socialism with some particular German nuances on both sides of the wall, so that when the wall opened in 1989, people were not rushing from west to east, they were rushing from east to west to get out of there. Well, as you point out, one of my favorite facts uh, about life is that when people praise the uh, egalitarian paradise of Cuba, strangely enough, uh, the guards in Cuba face toward the inside of the country, not the outside. They're trying to prevent Cubans from leaving. There aren't a lot of people in uh, Indiana trying to break into the, the Cuban paradise. And similarly, as you point out in your essay, uh, you didn't have to have any guards to prevent people leaving West Germany uh, in general because they didn't want to. And all the traffic was one way. So in the, in, the, in the aftermath of the Second World War, in the years 45, 46, 47, there were in fact some um, residents of what would become West Germany who were committed communists and they moved to the- Interesting. There's others for various ideological reasons who, who moved to the East, but these, these, are, these are tiny numbers, tiny numbers. If people could get out, they would get out. Uh, this led, this added to a capital drain and a brain drain that, uh, that make matters worse. But I don't think it was that brain drain that, that undermined East, the East German economy. It was the command and control economy that um, prevented innovation, prevented flourishing. So for you it's, and for me, it's an experiment with a pretty clear cut result. I think if you're a socialist in the United States or someone who considers himself a socialist, and of course that word is a, um, so it's sometimes called a suitcase word. You can stuff a lot of different things into it. Uh, they would they would say to you, well, we you know, we don't want that East German kind of communism with say the secret police and the um, the, the lack of innovation. We want we want our kind. Our kind will be different. So do you think there? Are, what do you think of that of that rejoinder? Is are there lessons for East Germany for us, or we just we're just going to avoid their mistakes if we head in that direction? I think there are lessons from East Germany and there are lessons from the whole socialist slash communist tradition. There are of course variations in, uh, in socialism uh, from uh, rigorous Stalinism to, uh, to what was the uh, Scandinavian welfare state. But at the core of it is the sense that the government should control a significant part of the economy. And to control a significant part of the economy, at least two different uh, consequences ensue. One is that you're going to um, reduce the possibility for, for innovation because you'll have bureaucracy in charge of making decisions with the likelihood, of course, of corruption, of picking favorites, of picking champions. And maybe it's that other company that would really be able to innovate, but it isn't chosen by the, by the bureaucrats. In addition, to, um, to be able to expropriate, to be able to take property away from individuals, you have to necessarily reduce the, um, the, 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 the range of free speech. There's no socialism that doesn't go hand in hand with restrictions and political liberty. And this is built into the socialist theory from Marx and Engels from the 19th century. Uh, there are socialists and communists who criticize it as they see that uh, repressive aspect of the regimes develop. But I think it's a mistake to imagine that you could have state control of the economy uh, without giving up uh, political liberties. I'm going to come back to that in our last part of our conversation, but Mike, I want to turn to you and um, ask you about private property in China and this risk of confiscation and um, corruption as well as a factor there. How much uh, respect for private property is there if you're an entrepreneur in China trying to start a business, trying to build something physically are you at risk of confiscation the way that certainly East Germans were and, and the way many people are in despotic regimes around the world today that don't have political freedom? Well, the ones who are most at risk are foreign businesses that go into China and open up joint ventures uh, with, with Chinese companies. And we have a great deal of, of evidence uh, of everything from obviously, you know, sort of sophisticated uh, attempts to to hack into systems and steal uh, data and intellectual property, 
to outright old fashioned, you know, something like Capone in the 1920s, they, the, the thugs come in and literally uproot the capital plant and take it out somewhere else. So certainly you have very little protection if you are, uh, if you are a, uh, a Western company, particularly a smaller Western company, not a big Western company that may have some ability to influence the government. Um, smaller, smaller. So in China, the, the, um, the, the, tr the truly private sector of the economy accounts for something like 90% of the profits uh, in the Chinese economy. And the state-owned sector accounts for obviously something like 10%. Those, those may not be exact figures, but they're very close. Um, and yet the, the, the size, uh, the absolute size of the state-owned economy is, is much bigger. It's, it's, it's role uh, in the economy. And, and these are companies that are protected by the government, right? So smaller companies find it harder to get financing. Smaller companies find it harder to win court cases. Smaller companies may not have that protection from larger companies coming in and muscling them out of the market. An interesting question would actually be, and I, I don't know, I don't know if anyone's really looked at it, the theft of intellectual property within China among Chinese companies. In fact, I do remember a, uh, someone who worked on, on AI coming to Stanford and giving a talk at Hoover saying, well, the first phase of our AI growth is we were stealing from you and now the second phase is we're stealing from each other. I, I, don't, I don't know if that's true, but, but, but clearly in, in a system in which crony style capitalism uh, and, and obviously state sponsored capitalism, state you know, mandated capitalism, directed capitalism, however you want to put it, is a fundamental feature, then, then everyone is at risk because it's, it, it's, it's not, there's not an independent judiciary, it's not a transparent system. So it's all capricious. It's, you know, do you know the right players? That's why we, in the beginning, we used to talk a lot about the founder of Huawei, Jen, who was in the Chinese military with the assumption that because he was in the military, even though he was fairly low level, he must have had patrons in the military and they became powerful and so on and so forth up the chain. Um, you know, Russ, one thing that we, we haven't done, there's, there's, there's lots of good work by different people out there, but we spent decades trying to figure out, first of all, how we can make money off of China and how strong China's going to become. What we didn't do was actually look at the different weaknesses within China so that we understand them better today. Uh, you know, not with the assumption necessarily that it would have slowed down dramatically. But um, I think there was a question in our in our queue about quality control, and and I mean these are things we just really we didn't look at. You you can piece together evidence. So for example, the U.S. military did a study a number of years ago about the component parts made in China that it uses in, in US weapon systems, or not even just weapons, I mean trucks, like trucks are can be a weapon system, but you know what I'm saying? Everything from the missiles, but down to the, to the anodyne stuff. Um, and, and there was one particular one, I, I didn't go back and look at it, but if I remember, it was rubber and tires that had been bought from a Chinese company. They were, they were just terrible quality and rotted and dangerous for our, for our soldiers to be using. And so th these are the types of things that we really didn't look at that you can find you can find pieces of, of evidence about it. And, it. and it goes back to this question, by the way, about IP theft and the degree to which China could really be playing any type of role that it played today in the world if it hadn't stolen so much. People always talk about, oh. yeah. Hendra, one of our uh, viewers asked why, why the world hasn't pushed back on that more uh, aggressively. Do you have any, uh, an answer for um, that? On the, the IP the, theft. Well, I think there's a lot of reasons. I mean, one was the the um, the dream of the China market is extraordinarily powerful, and it has been powerful for for centuries, not not just decades. Um, so the idea was that you know, yeah, if you lose a little bit through pilfering, which everybody does, the big the big game is really still out there. It's to get into that market, and and there's a billion Chinese who want to buy your coat hanger or whatever it is. Um, we're now at the beginning of, a, of what I think is a fundamental reassessment of that bargain that we made with ourselves, which was we would do lots of things. We would never uh, countenance with other nations. We would self-censor. We would turn the other cheek. We would do all these different things because the, uh, the idea of the market was so big. But now what we find out is that our companies are locked out of that market, that Chinese champions are in that market. Amazon can't break into that market. 
Uh, Google has problems in the market. Facebook's locked out of the market. Um, it, so uh, the Chinese have, have not created the fair playing field. And I think that what the Trump administration has done is has adopted this policy of reciprocity that it's on a lot of different issues, but on, on this economic issue is to say, look, we're gonna use tariffs, which is by the way, a time honored tactic that goes back to George Washington to use tariffs to try to force nations to change their behavior. We did it against the British in the, in the 1790s to, uh, to force Beijing now to begin leveling the playing field and giving us equal access. So I think you're right, we didn't do it. Hendra's right, we, we did not do it. It was a devil's bargain. It goes back decades, if not centuries in the American or the Western psyche about dealing with China. But that was always a China that was very weak. It was not a China that was dominating the global economy in so many ways as it is today. So today I think to lift the title from Dan, uh, 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 Halberstam's old book, um, The Reckoning, we are in a reckoning with China that's going to take the next generation. Let's come back to America now. Russell, what is your take on uh, why socialism is, is increasingly popular in the United States? Uh, until the pandemic, we had an incredibly strong economy, very uh, unimaginably low unemployment, uh, under 4%, which economists had assured us was impossible. Um, and yet, we're in a world now where, and this was before the pandemic, socialism is, a, is increasingly attractive. Uh, do you think it's a matter of not knowing the history or do you think Americans who consider themselves socialist uh, want something different than the, these two historical examples that we've been talking about? The Americans who want socialism would probably deny that they, uh, that they're, that they yearn for East Germany or for Maoist China. Uh, Nonetheless, it's not so much that they don't know the history, but that they know the wrong history. And this is a function of what's been going on in our schools, a kind of idealization of, uh, of socialism or communism as, uh, um, as I've said on other occasions, as uh, sometimes presented as, as an idea that is good, a theory that is good and it just was mismanaged. If we could only get it right and will be able to get it right, then we'll succeed. Add to that a degree of resentment uh, which uh, of uh, uh, hostility to those who are successful and who have uh, who have been able to obtain wealth and and add to that in the part of the um, the academic class a sense that uh, we as the experts would know how to run the economy better than than others who are who are less intellectual who are less uh, educated that all that feeds into this, uh, this 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 dream of socialism no doubt there are um, inequalities. No doubt there are uh, challenges the United States faces in terms of justice. Uh, and with that in the background, people turn toward uh, socialism as a fata morgana, as a, as a, as a, as a mirage of, of how to resolve matters. Uh, and that I think attributes to the popularity. Also add to this, um, I think the 2016 election was the was really the turning point. Uh, on both sides of the political spectrum, there was dissatisfaction with the political establishment, and on the Democratic side, there was a, a dissatisfaction with the uh, with the political leadership, and that was the Sanders revolt, and that has morphed into a wider aspiration for for control uh, that we see. Um, that we see uh, in the programs for expansion of government into environment, industry, education, healthcare, et cetera, coupled with the so-called cancel culture, which is the current American form to retract free speech. So all of that becomes our American socialism. Russell, we got a question from Gabriel. I think I'd like to hear your take on it, being a professor of the humanities. He suggests that the humanities have been corrupted by uh, a political influence, a desire to, to, in, to follow a political or ideological agenda. He asked if there's any hope for the uh, universities of the West in coming back to what the humanities used to be. Uh, I think he's right in his, uh, in his estimation. Um, I think there's an analytic question as to what extent they've been corrupted by outside influence and to what extent 
to what extent it's just been an endogenous development within within the humanities. But the real issue is how do we get to a humanities that is um, uh, productive for our society? And I think when we begin there, we, we would have to begin with the aspiration of a humanities that uh, doesn't begin a priori with the condemnation of the United States. We should be paying attention to the achievements as well as the failings, and not only the failings of the United States and of the West in general. How do we get there? Uh, I think we need um, a clear leadership on the part of um, university leaders, on the part of uh, um, donors to universities, on, part, on the part of the public. Um, the, um, there have been issues in this country with the press. There have been issues in this country with the entertainment industry. And I find the, uh, the challenges in higher education on the humanity side analogous. On the STEM side, we do a great job. Our en universities are the envy of the world. Uh, and at some points, maybe our successful scientists should begin to put pressure on their colleagues in the humanities. Uh, I want to mention to listeners and viewers that if you want to learn uh, about the texture of life in East Germany, beside reading Russell Berman's work, you, you might also consider watching the movie The Lives of Others, one of the most powerful indictments of the corruption of that system morally and economically. Uh, very intense movie, not for everybody, but uh, I recommend that strongly. And after you watch that movie, I don't think anyone would say, well, I think that's the country we all want to live in. And yet, despite that, Michael, uh, a lot of people uh, on the left and the right have nice things to say about China, which mystifies me. I think partly because the argument is, well, they know how to get things done. And we've got all this political dysfunction and, and gridlock. And well, they have a great system. They just they want to build a city or a subway. They just snap their fingers as none of this political infighting, and we should have more of that. Um, I think that misses, among other things, the non-economic costs of an authoritarian regime, the oppression of the Uyghurs you mentioned, and other factors. But what would you respond to people who, who would have us emulate China uh, in any way? Well, we only have a few minutes and that's that's a huge and in some ways the crucial question because we have changed ourselves to accommodate China. We have self-censored, look at the NBA, look at Hollywood. Um, so part of the reason for the, the global response that you just indicated is because China, uh, Beijing and, and the Communist Party have had a phenomenally successful propaganda and influence campaign about the world, uh, around the world. Um, our colleague Larry Diamond has been working on that here at Hoover, uh, has a new project on, on sharp power that China uses around the world. Uh, I've written what I call the new, about the new China rules. Um, Larry came out with a report on these influence campaigns. You, uh, unlike the Soviets, unlike the Nazis, unlike the Japanese in the 80s, you never see popular cultural treatments of China that are negative. So people are, are, are becoming um, you know, brainwashed in essence into believing that everything that goes on in China um, is, is really good. Now, I would say that we're about to see an extraordinary, I mean, so Russell was talking before about East Germany, West Germany, East Berlin, West Berlin, and, you know, Checkpoint Charlie, that used to be the, you know, the epicenter of the global struggle between, you know, free market liberalism, capitalism, and, and authoritarian communism. We're about to see another one. Um, the, the Iron Curtain, if you can put it that way, has moved to Hong Kong. And we are watching in real time and yeah. in extraordinarily quick real time, the destruction of a free society. Um, we can go into well, why that's happening and how people thought it might be happening more slowly or, or, or the like. But this is really the question. Now, can you have a continuing flourishing economic system in a political system that is increasingly repressive? Meaning, are people willing to take chances? How do you destroy social trust? between people. Uh, when you gut the rule of law, as is happening in China, uh, what does that do down the line in everything? But in this case, let's talk about the economics. So watch Hong Kong. Um, this is this is what China wants to do, obviously, to Taiwan. It, what's, it, it's what it wants to do to countries around the periphery so that they, in essence, to make the world safe for Chinese-style authoritarianism. 
Now, in this case, they haven't taken over the Hong Kong economy yet. That may happen, we don't know. But they have taken over Hong Kong civil society and its politics. So will Hong Kong in five years or maybe one year be the Hong Kong and as flourishing as it has been under a completely different political system? I think that is going to be a tragic and yet very illuminating laboratory to answer these questions and to answer your ultimate question, which is why would any of us want to live under that system? We have enough problems today with big tech uh, collection of data and information that we, we don't even know what's being collected. We don't know how it's being used. Now put it into social credit schemes like China has created so that you are denied healthcare, you're denied plane tickets, you're denied access to the best schools for your children because you're able to fuse ideology and political preferences with technological surveillance of every element of our lives. I think all of us who are my age and above on this call didn't grow up in that world. And so it's almost unimaginable to us that this can actually happen. Everyone younger than us probably thinks, yeah, that's completely natural. They may not worry about it, but they think it's absolutely natural that every single thing you do is recorded. And in this case now can be accessed and used by the government. So watch Hong Kong to answer these questions that you've asked. So I want to close. We've got about five minutes left. Uh, you can take a minute or two to answer this, this last question. I'm going to fuse two questions, one from Jeffrey and one from Chase. Uh, Jeffrey asks, isn't the embrace of socialism by many Americans a reaction to rising inequality? And uh, Chase makes the, the, the observation that, yeah, and that's why people just want a bigger, they want a higher tax, what their idea of socialism is a higher tax rate, more re redistribution, uh, lower income inequality, akin to the safety net of um, the Scandinavian countries. Russell, do you think we can have that level of social um, safety that, that the Scandinavians have and avoid the worst of uh, Germany and China that we're talking about politically? And then Michael, I'll let you answer the same question. Russell, go ahead. Okay, well, just to, to correct that impression, the Scandinavians, in fact, have turned away from the uh, fully developed social welfare models of the 1950s and 1960s, much more toward free market economies. One illusion is that socialism guarantees uh, equality, neither in East Germany and certainly not in contemporary China do you have anything like, uh, like equality. On the contrary, you have some who are well off and some who are very well off and others who aren't and that wealth differential maps onto differentials in, in freedom. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the elite in, uh, in East Germany were not facing the same uh, travel restrictions, say, that everyone else. If you were part of the elite in East Germany, you could travel to the West, not, not, not the workers who uh, were impoverished, who did not own cars, who could not, uh, um, who, who could not uh, move from job to job easily. So I think the choice is not uh, our inequality versus socialism, but do we want more prosperity in general for everyone, even if inequality persists? Better, better that we're all better off than that we're all equally poor. Well, a lot of people think that the growth of the last 40 years hasn't been shared very much with, with the bulk of the population. As uh, at policyed.org, we have a series uh, called the numbers game on this question. I think that the data on that has been distorted and misread. I think it's a much cheerier picture, but it, I think it's not necessarily widely believed cheeriness. Um, Michael, your take on this question of whether we can move and uh, take a small step towards some kind of socialism without uh, putting our foot in too big a hole. Oh, I, I wouldn't add much to what Russell said. I think he said it um, very well. I, I Maybe one way to answer it is um, this is what Xi Jinping and the Communist Party is actually trying to tell us, right? That that you can have socialism with Chinese characteristics, right? They're, they're very clear. This is not Stalinism, and it's not. There aren't people being shot in the back of the head by the, by the tens of thousands. It's not Maoism, uh, which destroyed the economy and then destroyed its own culture. Um, what she is trying to say to the world, it's what he says when he goes to Davos, and it's what he says um, when, he, when he sees there's an opening in the United States 
um, to, to appeal to people is that right, we have a much fairer system. They're, they're pointing to the riots that we're undergoing in this country right now and the, the underlying equality that is that sparks a lot of this or certainly is claimed to spark a lot of this, that their system prevents that. Now, he doesn't acknowledge that there are 200,000 riots a year in China because people are dissatisfied. He doesn't talk about the fact that you have no recourse under their system to a, an independent court system. You have no recourse to a, a free media to try to get your case out. But they'll, they'll talk about the gross figures of bringing up hundreds of millions uh, out of poverty. And so the answer uh, certainly is not the Chinese style, because what I think we are going to see in the long run, and, and the long run is actually coming soon because we've been undergoing this for 50 years or more uh, with China, is that it's, it's far less of a of a boon for as many people as as the Chinese claim, and maybe the, the the style of socialism, if I can put it that way, that's that's more humane and more beneficial is actually Japanese style state capitalism, where you do have a thriving democracy, and yet you have limitations on the type of economic activity that is that is allowed. The state is is more interventionist than it is here. Uh, it certainly did its fair share of picking winners and losers. Um, but that's all done within a very different political and social rubric. It, it, is, it, is, it is a rubric not of fake socialist equality in which, in which some animals are more equal than other animals, to use Orwell's you know, terminology, um, but rather that everyone is an equal citizen under the law and has recourse to independent courts. So maybe we'll look back at Japan, in fact, and see that as a more effective system that is somewhat hybrid uh, and yet tends more towards uh, individual freedom and more towards the ability of society itself to determine the, the boundaries of, of just how much competition it wants to accept versus the state telling it how much competition it's going to accept. I want to thank both of our participants today. Ellie, uh, one of our viewers asked for the name of that movie again. It's The Lives of Others. And it was also a request to repeat the uh, URL for the uh, data on inequality. Uh, it's a four-part series, soon to be five. You can find it at policyed.org slash numbers game with a dash between numbers and game. Um, policyed.org slash numbers dash game. I want to thank our guests today, our panelists, Michael Oslin and Russell Berman for a fascinating conversation and let you know about the, uh, there are two more events coming up on in this series. The first is November 12th, Elizabeth Economy and Larry Diamond on Democracy and Authoritarianism, and December 3rd, Impacts the Government Sponsored Programs with Scott Atlas and John Kogan. Thanks for joining us. Everybody have a great day. Mm -hmm.